Hey, Campfire crew, let's get it on. Hey, gang, I apologize for this, but uh, my sinuses and throat are hamburger right now. Working on the next episode, which I hope you'll really, really enjoy. It's some more outdoor stuff. But for the time being, please enjoy this best of true ghost and paranormal stories volume. Creepy Corridor by Gingerbread From September of 2007 until April of 2011, I studied history and English online through Lakehead University, located in the small town of Thunder Bay in northern Ontario. During the first week of December of 2007, I finally finished my midterm exams after a painstaking weekend of traveling back and forth between the cities of Coburg and Oshawa. We decided to celebrate by spending some time with my great aunt at the Oshawa Shopping Center and getting an early start on Christmas shopping. By the time the mall was about to close, we left for home. Before driving our great aunt back home, my brother decided to stop for gas. He stepped out of the car to pump it and left me alone in the car with my great aunt. In order to start up a conversation, I informed her of our summer trip through Gettysburg in August of the same year. She listened with interest to every word, particularly the instance in which we heard the mysterious sounds of rifles during a tour. In response to this, she mentioned one particular incident she experienced many years prior to our conversation, one in which I was never made aware of until that moment. She mentioned that the incident occurred during a trip to Toronto she took with my great-uncle just before Christmas in 1989. They decided to spend the weekend at a luxury hotel and reserved a room on the seventh floor. My great-uncle, exhausted from the trip, decided to go to sleep early. Not wanting to disturb him, my great-aunt decided to leave the room and take a short walk throughout the hotel. After spending roughly an hour wandering the hotel absorbing her surroundings and admiring the interior design of the building, she lost track of time and decided to head back to their room. The elevator stopped on the seventh floor and my great-aunt walked nonchalantly back towards her room. She approached it and began quietly unlocking the door to avoid any possibility of waking my great-uncle. She abruptly stopped about halfway as she suddenly felt the most uncomfortable sensation that someone was watching her. She turned apprehensively to her right and immediately realized that her suspicions were correct. Standing in the middle of the corridor was a young boy she assumed to be around the age of nine. She mentioned vividly remembering the boy standing motionless with a completely blank expression on his face. Feeling awkward, she asked him if he was all right or if he was in need of any help. Her question went completely unacknowledged, and the boy just continued to stand in the same spot, staring off into the void as if his full attention was permanently fixated on some mysterious psychological entity. My great aunt proceeded to turn back to unlock the door, and she decided to ask the uncanny juvenile one last time if he needed something, only to discover he was no longer present. She found herself completely alone in the hallway, and despite feeling extremely uneasy, she decided to not wake up my great uncle to inform him of the encounter, and promptly went to sleep. The following day she decided to head to the hotel bar for a glass of wine. She struck up a conversation with the bartender and informed him of the bizarre incident. At first she was reluctant to share any information with him, concerned that he wouldn't believe her, but the bartender had no issues believing her. He merely smiled and said, Yeah, that kid's been here for years. My great aunt never uncovered any explanation behind the experience or what may have possibly been going through the boy's mind. Unfortunately, I have long since forgotten the name of the hotel they stayed at and may never discover the truth for myself. Stick Indians by Can't Unseen It In 1987, I was looking for and purchased a one-plus acre lot for $3,000 off an Indian reservation in Mason County, Washington, about 30 minutes from my work. I was making payments as I lived there, and I paid off the property in 1989. 
I would go out to the property whenever I had time. It was a beautiful drive up the river, with the winding river down below on my left, and steep hillside to the right. The road was cut out of the hill. It was more like a bumpy logging road. I headed up to go to camp on my property one weekend, and prior to that I had always just waved at the native man, a woman, and three kids when I drove by if they were outside. On this day, I decided to stop and introduce myself, so I pulled down into the driveway of the property with trash everywhere. I started walking up to the porch and noticed to my left two white blobs that I eventually realized were perfectly skinned large beavers lying on their backs, lined up like trophies. Seeing this made me sad. They weren't for food, just for pelts. So I knocked and introduced myself, telling the native I had purchased property about a mile up the river from him. I told him I'd be camping on the property and playing around the river, and he told me that the Indians don't sleep in the woods there because of the stick Indians. I don't remember too much more about our conversation. But as I was leaving, he wanted to show me his catch from a recent saltwater fishing trip down the road from there. I followed him to the other side of the boat in his yard, and I saw 15 very small, illegal-sized red cod that had been filleted and thrown everywhere. After seeing that, I really wanted to get out of there, so I headed to my property. I had no issues at the property and eventually had my A-frame-style chalet home built, finally moving in by mid-1990. I didn't have any power for six months and no water for over a year. I was single at the time I moved in, and my bedroom was in the upper half of the top floor of the chalet, called a crow's nest, and I could look down into my living room. The A-frame peak was in the middle of my bed, and the upper floor walls leaned into the peak, kind of cramped around the bed. The window was directly above the head of my bed, and no drapes were needed at that height. I was alone in the woods, after all. On one night, I was awakened by an all-consuming constant high-vibration rattle, if you can picture a wood tube half filled with 500 metal BBs in it being shaken as fast as possible, that would be as close to what I could describe as the sound. Or maybe shaking seeds in an oversized pod times 1000. It was so hard to describe the constant and rhythmic deafening sound it was making throughout my house in the upstairs room. I mean, I can't give this justice in words. I quickly sat up in bed and thought maybe there was a craft above my home. But looking out the window, it was dark, and I could see the trees ten feet away out of my bedroom window. When the rattling started, scared may not be the perfect word for me, but maybe disbelief or partial panic. The sound was a menacing, overwhelming rattle that lasted maybe ten minutes or longer, and it freaked me out. I couldn't imagine having been sleeping outside or in a tent and hearing that. I was twelve feet off the ground in my home, protected by wood walls, after all. In the eight years I owned that property, that only happened once and in the dark. I wondered later if it was the Stick Indians and maybe they weren't happy, and maybe that was them voicing their opinion. Ghost with Mental Illness by Tweed Over the years hearing all these ghost stories and paranormal stories, I've found some hauntings so bizarre for the people experiencing them. But if viewed through the perspective of a ghost who lived with a mental illness, could follow some logic. Obviously, not all hauntings can be or shouldn't be explained away by a mental illness. I don't believe everyone necessarily carries their emotional mental state with them on the other side. But I've come to believe occasionally some do to some extent for one reason or another. If I didn't know the woman-slash-ghost in this haunting, I don't know if I'd have connected the dots. I'd like you to meet V, my stepmom's mother. V was and is a pretty typical Australian woman. Wicked sense of humor, very outspoken, and opinionated about everything. Friendly, always up for a chat. Never without a cigarette or two on the go. Loved animals, had a lot of pets. Hated swearing. I mean, her catchphrase would be, don't swear. It's what she'd yell if she ever heard you swearing. My stepmom's father swore a fair bit, and their pet parrot learned to repeat, Don't swear! in V's voice. It was pretty classic. V passed away in 1995 after a long struggle with something. She didn't want her family to know what she was dying from, but everyone assumed it was lung-related because she chain-smoked her entire life. 
Her family likely knew towards the end, but I have never known. My stepmother had a long interest in what used to be known as multiple personality disorder. Now known as dissociative identity disorder, V likely suffered from this condition throughout her life. However, she was never formally diagnosed. Partly because she didn't trust doctors, and partly because this condition was seldom taken seriously in the mainstream back then. Therefore, research and findings were scarce. Regardless of what you call it, this condition presents as distinct breaks in personality and identity, dizzy or fainting spells, memory or time loss, severe headaches, and migraines. It's brought on by severe and chronic early childhood trauma, with the majority being chronic sexual abuse at an early age. I've known V since I've known my stepmom, C, which would be since around 1987 when I was about six. My stepmother, C, told me about the condition when I was about 12. I remember saying how I thought that stuff only happened in movies. I couldn't believe it. She went on to tell me how it's formed and the criteria for diagnosis, and I have to admit as a young lass, I found it morbidly fascinating. It wasn't until years after V's passing that C told me why and how she became interested in the condition. Up until I was about 20, I didn't know anything was wrong with V. C began telling me the things V used to do, most things I had no knowledge of, and how V had ticked every diagnosis criteria. I began to understand a handful of bizarre behaviors I'd witnessed from V growing up. While V was alive, I wasn't around her long enough to really notice much, but for a handful of moments. I probably averaged about two to three hours with V at a time, around four times a year, so not a lot of time to build a big picture. The first time V haunted me was not long after she passed, mid-1990s. We, that is my brother and I, stayed at Dad and C's place every second weekend. C had lost a piece of jewelry, I don't remember exactly what it was, but C was sure she'd lost it at home and she was getting herself distraught. She spent the afternoon and evening looking everywhere. We were asked not to wear shoes inside and not to walk along the perimeter of the lounge room in case it had fallen off a windowsill. Stepmom wasn't the tidiest person. But anyway, she couldn't find it. That evening or the next morning, I had a dream. In the dream it was morning, and I floated from the spare room where I slept, down the hallway, through the lounge room, into the kitchen. V was sitting on a kitchen chair directly in front of the fridge. I floated up to her and she said, Tell T it's behind the curtain. I woke up. It was morning. I don't remember if I got up or went back to sleep. In the dream, V called my stepmom C by the nickname her family called her. And it might be worth mentioning, I had started reading about astral travel and the like at the time, which may have made a difference. Stepmom didn't believe in anything supernatural so I was definitely not going to pass on the message. But later that evening, she found her jewelry behind the curtain in their bedroom. I thought it would be behind the lounge curtain and had been waiting for an opportunity to go look. We were still under instruction not to walk the perimeter of that room lest we trod on it. They had the carpet from hell back then. It swallowed everything. The rest of the night was my exasperated dad yelling about why couldn't she look after her jewelry better. And how could she not know what room it was in, etc.? Stepmom still puts jewelry in random places. In the dream, V was sitting in front of the fridge. For reasons unknown to me, the fridge was off limits for us kids while in V's presence. I know it had something to do with opening the door all the way, and looking back now, I say it was kind of a trigger for her. Whenever she was there, the fridge would be open the least amount possible, regardless of whose place you were at. V hoarded scissors. I don't know why. Their kitchen was filled with pairs of scissors. Apparently the kitchen drawers were packed full of more scissors. I mean, just so many scissors. Over ten years ago, I had a pair of scissors go missing. I was doing some gardening and came in to get the scissors for the packaging of I don't recall what. But I couldn't find the scissors. I'm the opposite of my stepmom. I know where everything is. I'm pretty fastidious about it. But after a day or so, I bought a new pair of scissors, put them in the same place the old ones were, 
in a cup on the kitchen bench. The same day I came back inside from gardening, and there's the old scissors on the bench, clear as day, next to the cup. The new ones were still standing in. I started thinking about V and scissors and wondered if she wanted me to start a scissors collection. This reminds me of all the times as a teenager the scissors would go missing in the home, which made me wonder if she was to blame for all those scissors too. I found the whole notion extremely annoying. I mean, scissors went AWOL a few times after that and would turn up a few days later in some obvious place somewhere in the kitchen. But I didn't buy any new ones. When B, V's husband and stepmom's father, passed away, the scissors activity stopped. B was a great guy and had a calming effect on V, so I was glad it appeared that the same thing was happening in the hereafter. But I believe on this occasion, it was V. Stepmom and I were driving down the freeway. I was the passenger. It was the afternoon and there had been some strong wind the previous night. A lot of branches were scattered around the road and stepmom commented that the council had chosen the wrong kind of trees for that location. Then there was a bang on or in the car. I got a fright, but stepmom didn't. She just kept talking about the council. I said I thought there was a branch stuck in the wheel well, but stepmom said it was okay. There was no more noise, but I kept watching the passenger side mirror, waiting for a branch to be flung somewhere. Then there was another bang. I mean, these bangs were really loud. I suggested we pull over because it didn't sound like the kind of noise you ignore, but stepmom brushed it off, and there were a couple more bangs. I started to wonder if the bangs were coinciding with unladylike language. C changed the subject, but the bangs timed thusly. C said, I've been watching Downton Abbey. Me, what are you watching that shit for? Bang! C. I know, your father hates it too. But there was this bit, you would have loved it. This guy's ulcer burst and it was fucking brilliant. Bang! The only thing that shit me was bang! The blood should have been black and there should have been way more of it. She then told me about these burst ulcers at the hospital where she worked. And there was more banging. I said it was naive to expect Martin Scorsese realism in a production aimed at the Agatha Christie audience. Which sort of ended the topic. The banging ended when C stopped talking about Downton Abbey and hospital gore. It's very odd being the only one taking something that bizarre that seriously. I wondered if the banging was V visiting for Christmas because it seemed to time with the swearing. Plus, V hated any talk of gore. It could have been my father's mate banging for joy at the gruesome discussion, which I could also believe. But I doubt it because the banging was in the car, too, and it was so violent. It seemed angry. Not like the foot stomping dad's mate would do. A few years ago, I had a bit of a meltdown after this very Christmas. A few years ago, I had a bit of a meltdown after Christmas. The event is what tipped me. A few days after the car thing, I was at Dad and C's for a New Year's or Christmas event. Back then, I used to visit Melbourne for a few weeks at Christmas, and I would either borrow cars or carpool from here to there. That evening, Dad was driving me back to Mum's place. It was getting late, everyone had left, the weather was cold, and their heater was on. (laughs) Melbourne summers are weird. There was a Christmas card on top of the mantel clock, and the warm air from the gas heater was rising in just the right spot to make the card on the clock do a jig. It swayed from side to side, and as I noticed it, I said, Hey look, the ghost of Christmas past. Unbeknownst to me, that was the worst thing to say. Dad had a brief defensive reaction until he saw the card. Stepmom came in from another room, also a bit defensive, asking, What's this? I explained about the card, but then she calmed down. Then I asked Dad about a ghost he saw many years ago, to which he said, Oh yeah, I saw that. But then he all of a sudden snapped and shouted, But I don't know what it was. There's no such thing as ghosts, and I didn't see any ghost, and there's no afterlife or heaven. I mean, you get the idea. It was suddenly on like Donkey Kong. My dad, the guy I used to talk about ghosts with when I was a kid, had suddenly turned into Richard Dawkins, seemingly out of nowhere. Then my stepmom started talking about how they've proved that people who see ghosts are having a type of epileptic seizure. 
While Dad still yelled about having never seen any ghosts, things went on for ten minutes in the house and continued in the car on the drive back. All the freaking way until I bid them goodbye and went inside. These strange bangs lasted half an hour. I usually get car seat in the back seat, so Dad and Stepmom always liked me in the front. The drive back sucked. Dad wouldn't calm down. I kind of went numb and tried not to prod the beast any further. But Stepmom kept chiming in from the back seat about how she loves that people never see animal ghosts, only human ghosts. I bit my tongue there. I knew what was going on, and they were feeding off of one another, and I opted out of that discussion. Stepmom said something which prompted me to look around the back at her, doing so out of politeness. I don't remember exactly what was said, just that it was something anti-anti-ghost. But I saw two people in the back seat, instead of just her. Stepmom was sitting behind the driver's seat, looking out of the passenger window which I thought was odd because she was addressing me. A split second after I noticed the other figure in the back, I noticed it had V's tracksuit pants and slippers on, and her black jumper. One of the few behavioral shifts I'd seen from V growing up was that sometimes V had a black jumper on. That was strange because she hated black. She hated people wearing black and said it looked like you were dressed for a funeral. She always wore colorful clothing, and whenever she had the black jumper on, she was aloof. No eye contact, except if it was to yell briefly at someone for coming near her. She always seemed like she wanted to be left alone. It didn't make much sense. I knew about depression as a child, and I think I must have assumed something along those lines. Anyway, I looked at the face of the figure in the black jumper and saw V's glasses and hair, but her skin looked burned or charred. I can't say how transparent or solid this apparition was because I looked straight ahead immediately and stayed fixed on the road ahead and my shoes for the rest of the journey. I also don't know if my stepmom saw anything or if that's why she turned in the other direction. I can only assume that all this dialogue really pissed V off enough to tip her over the edge. I don't know what the charred appearance was all about and perhaps that's how part of her perceives herself. I wonder if the heightened emotion in the car made it easy for her to appear in the back. And I also wondered how long she'd been there. Had she followed us from the house? Or was she in the car all the time? How long had she been in black jumper mode? Was black jumper mode responsible for the banging on the car the other day? So many questions. Pretty shaken up that evening, I got home and immediately asked my guardian to take V and black jumper alter back to her husband B, or back to wherever she should be, because it wasn't healthy for her to be there. That was the last time I was visited by V. I've had a couple of dreams about her, though. In these dreams, she's herself. She tells me to tell everyone she's still here. So probably a visitation dream? One of my grandmothers does this too, but more politely. I think they've teamed up in the afterlife. Like my stepmom, I've carried on learning about the condition over the years, and my feeling is it's part of PTSD, but it's how PTSD manifests itself within a developing mind and as such requires different treatment and diagnoses. It's astonishing the ability of the mind to preserve itself. Whatever condition V had in life seems to have followed her. I guess whatever you don't deal with in life, you must deal with on the other side. But according to the dreams I have, She's doing okay now. Anyone could be forgiven for thinking demon or another entity if they'd seen V in the back of the car. But I know it was her, and I don't know what I would have thought had I not known her. The Haunted Warehouse by Nate800 True Story, Honor System I work in a warehouse that my father purchased. He bought it for 25% of its cost from a farmer who seemed very excited to be rid of it. It's in the middle of Mennonite country with no neighbors for a half mile around. Look out the window and you see cornfields and scraggly trees. Cell service? Forget about it. I work there alone, painting and prepping it for the front office portion for eventual functionality. 
To get to the front office, you must go through a hallway from the main warehouse into a secondary office and then through another door into the front. I frequently heard bumps and thuds and I occasionally went into the warehouse and felt air movement, but I've always attributed it to drafts and animal life in the roof. The only thing that has ever made me uneasy about the building is the fact that all of the door locks are reversed. Whoever installed those locks didn't intend to keep people out. They intended to keep something in. I was in the front office when I began to hear the thudding. I ignored it and continued to apply masking tape to the door I was working on. But this time, it was accompanied by a screeching sound. Not loud, but audible. I was freaked out, but convinced myself that it was just a pissed-off raccoon or squirrel that had found its way inside. I continued working until I heard the slam. The door to the secondary office had been open. It sounded like it had violently slammed shut. I peeked around the corner and saw that I was right. The secondary door was now closed. I tried to logic it through in my head that a strong draft had sucked it closed, although I knew there was no such draft. The thudding began again, closer this time. I wasn't able to put a proximity on it, but it, now it sounded like it was right on the other side of the door. I froze, unsure of what was happening. My eyes locked on the door handle, which began to turn. The door disengaged its latch and slowly swung open. Wider and wider. There was nothing there. Nothing visible. No air movement. Just quiet. So quiet. A quiet that seemed to overwhelm me with its presence. A quiet so thick I couldn't breathe. The quiet was shattered when the screech came. This time, it was clearly human. Pained, angered, and emanating from the main warehouse. The door slammed. That entirely broke my frozen fearful state. I ran. I got into my car and drove until I was in cell range to call my father. He didn't believe anything about the doors closing, but agreed that the building had something weird about it. He told me he'd be right out. Fast forward half an hour. My dad and I met up and drove back to the warehouse. I showed him the door that slammed, showing him that it was separated from both the front office and the main warehouse, so no draft could have closed it. I told him about the thuds, the screeching, and the sudden quiet that overcame the building. He decided that we should check the main warehouse. Emboldened by his presence, I led the way. Something you should know about this warehouse. It was formerly a furniture manufacturing place owned by a Mennonite farmer. They made handmade chairs, tables, etc. And because of all the cutting that went on, the floor was thickly coated with dust. We walked into the warehouse and saw nothing out of the ordinary. The dust was untouched, the doors were closed, and the windows were locked. The only thing out of the ordinary was one of the hanging fluorescent light fixtures. It was hanging askew and swaying slightly. Insisting we take a look at the mount to ensure it didn't just break loose, my dad grabbed a stepladder and he supported it while I climbed up and grabbed the swinging light. I looked on top of the light and saw a handprint. A single, fresh, inhumanly large handprint. No footprints in the dust around the light. No signs of a presence. I climbed down and switched places with my father. He saw it and said, What the hell? There hasn't been anyone out here for years. He climbed down and told me he'd been suspicious of someone breaking in and stealing parts from the warehouse light system. He couldn't believe me that this wasn't human, that something wasn't right there. The last thing he said was, Nothing's here. Next time, just go back to work. And then, as if to show its presence, the thud returned. This time it wasn't just a thud, more of an earthquake. The entire building felt like it moved. The heartbeat-like thud was then overlaid by the screech. That awful, awful screech. It felt like it was coming from the walls themselves. We ran. We ran and I haven't returned. My father hired someone to finish my job and has since moved into the office. He's heard the thudding, but thus far nothing else has happened. But what actually happened? I don't know. Nor do I ever care to know.
What I do know is that there is something paranormal in that building, and the man who sold it to us knew. I'll never forget the sound of that lock turning by itself, or the feeling of that deafening silence. The Bomb Dump by Nero Joe Former Air Force here. I was a munition systems technician, and I worked in a very large storage facility called a bomb dump in Europe. This place had dozens of buildings, including many earth-covered magazines called igloos housing thousands of bombs. This facility was pretty big. It was about nine square miles, I think. An interesting thing about this bomb dump was that it was completely forested and populated with wildlife. Most are deforested because of the fire hazard, but the country that this bomb dump was in required that the area be maintained as a natural preserve. Now, despite having a small deer population, this forest wasn't nice and clear. Most forests have a fire or two to clear them out every 20 years or so. This forest had played host to munitions storage since WW2 and had no fires since. It was thick, dark, and dank. The trees were so overgrown that you would be hard-pressed to see 10 yards in a straight line. Anyway, it was a pretty creepy place at night. Hell, it was a pretty creepy place in the daytime. Twice a day, we had to run a security check to make sure that no holes had been cut through the fence and all the buildings were closed and locked. However, this wasn't the job of the swing shifters. We were a skeleton crew. The checks were run by the morning and afternoon crews, unless, of course, they fucked up which they did one afternoon. The one guy in control doesn't realize that no PM security check was run until about 1 a.m. Since no one was working dispatch, he just walked down to our hall office and asked us to run it. We had finished all of our work early, so we were playing split-screen Halo, which was new at the time. Me and my friend Brian volunteered to take a truck out and run the check, so we grabbed a walkie-talkie and a flashlight and headed out. First we ran the perimeter, about an 8 or 12 mile trip, but we had to go about 15 miles an hour top, so it took quite a while. When we started building check, it was about 2 a.m. We began at the back. I can't remember how it went now, but we had an efficient system for checking every building without having to double back. Anyway, we started as far back from our building and coworkers as possible. Well. Brian decided that a piss and a cigarette were in order before we began the building check, which would take us another hour or so. He shut the truck off, dropped the tailgate, and we just sat and chilled in utter darkness while he burned down his sig. To this day, I don't know why he shut that ignition off. When we hopped back in and tried to start the truck again, nothing happened. The ignition simply didn't fire. No attempted turnover... No sputter and fail, just silence. It must have been an electrical problem. Well, fuck. We both thought it and said it simultaneously. Control, this is storage one. We're broke down out here. Silence. Control, we're out past building 70. We need a ride. You copy? Silence. We tried the walkie-talkie for a good 15 minutes before we realized that we would be walking back. Now, we could have stuck to the road. There were no street lights, but at least we would know where we were going. We would have to walk about a mile northward to the main corridor and then turn east for another three miles. Not too bad. But for some reason, we thought it would be much faster to take a shortcut through the forest. I actually knew this was a shitty idea. But I had a man card to preserve, so I went along with the idea. No matter what logical idea I came up with for sticking to the road, it always sounded like, I'm a giant pussy, when I said it in my head. So I trudged out into the woods with Brian. You'd think that Brian had balls of steel. You'd think that he would shrug off any spooky shit just to save some face. This was all his testosterone-laden idea anyway, after all. Well, that wasn't so. Brian was scared shitless about ten minutes in. Now, I wasn't too scared. I knew it was a bad idea, but I wasn't about to lose it or anything. However, Brian's anxiety was strong and I could sense it. And worst of all, it was getting increasingly contagious. Walking through the thick woods is slow. 
Neither of us had watches on, and our cell phones were back in our lockers. Before, we just went off the clock in the truck, but that truck was a quarter mile away now. So we had no real idea what time it was, but we were too far in the woods to go back. I knew that we weren't going in a straight line. We were meandering about, but I did know that we should have almost been to one of the rows of the buildings. It was probably only 20 minutes since we had left the truck, but it might as well have been hours when we reached the row of buildings. These were old buildings, above-ground brick structures, not the concrete igloos. The above-ground magazines had specially designed roofs that would blow upwards in the event of a catastrophic explosion, minimizing damage to nearby structures. They were also some of the oldest buildings in the bomb dump, little newer than WW2 itself. They were ramshacked, rusted, and coated in moss. Inside, they were dank and moldy. The only thing we kept in them were plain MK-82 bomb bodies, the least expensive and least sensitive stock that we had. The only saving grace about these buildings was the dim industrial lights over their doorways. While not ideal, the soft orange glow was a welcome break from our flashlight. We started walking down the gravel road that these buildings lined. We passed one, then another, and another. Then... Holy fucking shit, Joe. One of the buildings was open. The big steel blast doors were sealed, but the side door for personnel to use was propped open with a fucking rock. Uh, Control, this is Storage 1. Uh, Building 62 is not secure. Silence. Did you get that, Control? Building 62 is open. Silence. I looked at Brian. You know, we have to check this out, right? Though it was too dark to tell, I'm pretty sure Brian went a little pale. Yep. We approached the door like Osama bin Laden was going to jump out with his fucking scimitar and gut us. After all, we didn't have weapons on us. I stuck my head in. Hello? I felt a chill roll over me as I entered. Brian followed. It stunk in the building. It smelled like wet concrete and mildew. I shined the flashlight down a row of bombs. There were hundreds in there. When I was satisfied, we headed back to the doorway. We didn't have the keys to lock it up, but at least we could say that it was secure. That's when I heard it. The most blood-curdling scream I have ever heard. My heart went into my fucking throat. Brian just ran. I just followed him. We ran all the way out of the building across the road and into the trees across the drive. What the fuck? Brian was shaking. I'm pretty sure that I was too. I'm not sure how I got out of breath. We only ran about 20 yards from the building, but it felt like I had just run a fucking marathon. I hunkered down, resting my palms on my knee. What the fuck was that? It sounded like a fucking banshee man, Brian said. Then my heart sank. Oh, Jesus. We left the door open. Just fuck it, said Brian. Dude, we can't. We already called it in. We'd be fucked. For the next minute or ten, we just sat there panting, watching the door. Whatever was in there, it seemed to have no interest in following us out. Brian and I looked at each other and knew that we had to go shut the door. We both began walking up to it slowly. I was careful not to shine the flashlight into the door. I didn't want to get the attention of whatever was in there. We paused about three feet from the door. We'll just shut it, dude. And we did. I slid the rock away with my foot, and Brian gently closed the door. Not another noise came from Building 62. The Voices on the Phone by Carolyn D. When I was pregnant with my oldest daughter, Mike and I bought a house in the Catskill Mountains in upstate New York. It was in the middle of nowhere, and we drove down winding roads for 40 minutes just to go grocery shopping. Then most of our neighbors were only around in the summer or on holidays. It was a nice little house next to a creek, and in the kitchen mounted on the wall was an old-fashioned dial phone with a coiled cord. When we first moved in, I picked up the receiver and heard a quiet conversation between two women about hair dye. I didn't want to eavesdrop, so I said, Hello, who is this? The ladies stopped talking, 
Then one said, Did you hear that? Yes, is someone there? Hi, can you hear me? I said. But then it was silent. No voices, just a faint dial tone. I quickly decided this old phone was somehow hooked up to an old-fashioned party line. After that, we used the phone very little, preferring our cordless phone hooked up in the other room. The handful of times I did use that phone, I could hear whispered voices in the background, always assuring the other person that the line sometimes picked up other calls. A year and a half passed, and we mostly forgot the phone was even there. Then in September of 1999, Hurricane Floyd passed through our area, leaving us without power and the road with large, impassable trees blocking the way. Fortunately, we were already prepared. We had stored food and clean water in a paranoid frenzy for Y2K, and we desperately needed it all. We bathed in the creek, painted in the day, and played board games by candlelight while waiting for our power to be restored. After a week, the road was clear, but still no power, and it was getting tedious for Mike and me, though one-year-old Chloe was loving all of it. I lamented that we couldn't call my sister as the cordless phone didn't work without electricity, and we heard an unfamiliar ring. It was the wall phone in the kitchen. I raced to it and heard the faint voice of my sister. She was just checking in on us and invited us up to her place until our power came on. So off we went for five days, and when we returned, everything was back to normal, and I was so glad we had a hardwired phone that didn't rely on electricity. A couple of years passed, and the phone was mostly ignored, except by three-year-old Chloe, who thought it would look better covered in sparkly stickers. The power went out at least once or twice a summer, usually just for a few hours. During one of these outages, Mike decided to try the phone in the kitchen to make a call, but it was dead. Concerned, he drove up the road to the local country store and called AT&T's service line. I believe the conversation went something like this. Uh, hello, yes, my phone has stopped working. Uh, can I have your account number? Yes, it's X number. Well, I don't see anything wrong here. Well, we don't have any power right now. Well, that would be the problem. Uh, no, but we have an old-fashioned dial phone hooked up in the kitchen. It should still work. I'm sorry, but according to our records, you have no phone in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, we do. I've used it. No, you don't. If you do, it's not connected through us. Oh, okay. After this, Mike came home, walked into the kitchen, and pulled the phone off the wall. The only wire in it was about three inches long and was attached to nothing. It was never hooked up. The California Ghost Joe Himes, a reporter, and his actress wife, Elka Summer, moved into a two-story home in Beverly Hills, California in July of 1964. Only a few days later, the first of a series of reports of a ghost began. Mr. Himes was not home, and his wife had invited a guest for tea during the afternoon. As the guest, a journalist, described the incident to an investigator later, she saw a man come out of the area of the swimming pool where she was visiting. He walked quickly around the pool and seemed to be looking intently at something. She described him as being middle-aged with a potato nose. He was dressed in a black suit with a white shirt and tie. The guest was puzzled because she had not been introduced to the man, and when she glanced toward him a second time, he was no longer there. She asked what had become of the man, but nobody knew whom she was talking about. A similar experience was related about two weeks later by a man who was cleaning the swimming pool. He had been told that the house would be empty that day since the owners were away. Therefore, he was surprised when he glanced in the window and saw a man walking quickly toward the dining room with his hands behind his back. He described him as an older, heavyset man with graying hair, wearing dark trousers and a white shirt and tie. The maintenance man went into the house to see who was there, but could not find a trace of the man he had seen through the windows. Mr. Hyams actually wrote an article for the Saturday Evening Post relating the series of strange events in the house. He and his wife noticed unusual noises coming from the dining room at night, like the sound of chairs being pushed back from the table. But every time they checked, the chairs were all in place. During August, Mr. Hyams happened to be staying home alone for a few weeks, and he had the strange feeling that someone was there with him. Each morning, a particular downstairs bedroom window that had been shut and locked the night before was found open. The front door was heard to open and shut twice, 
but no one was there. And the sounds of chairs being pushed back from the table in the dining room continued. In an attempt to solve the problem, Mr. Hyams brought three miniature radio transmitters and three FM radios to pick up the signals. He also purchased three tape recorders, one for each radio. He placed one microphone near a driveway entrance, another at the front door, and a third one on the bar in the dining room. The equipment was turned on that night so that any sounds would be broadcast upstairs to the radios in the bedroom. At the same time, they would be recorded on the tape machines. The noise of the chairs moving below was heard again, this time clearly over the broadcast system. Mr. Himes went downstairs with a pistol, and when he switched on the dining room lights, the sound stopped. All the chairs were in place. The positions of the legs had been marked on the floor earlier with chalk, and nothing had been moved. When the tape was played back later, the entire sequence was there. First the sounds of the chairs moving, then the sound stopping as the click of the light switch was heard. The tape also picked up the noise of Mr. Himes coughing while he was in the dining room. Then after he had left the room, the tape picked up still more sounds of the chairs moving. A friend of Mr. Himes's, who had not been told about the ghost, stayed in the house while his own was being redecorated and the Himes were away. The friend wrote to Mr. Himes, giving his own report of the same noises and the strange opening of the same downstairs window. Mr. Himes hired a private detective to watch the house while he was away, and the detective reported seeing all the lights go on at once, when no one was home. The strange events and reports continued. Altogether, four people witnessed an unknown man moving around the house. These reports were separated by varying periods of time. Information about the case reached the Neuropsychiatric Institute at UCLA. Dr. Constance and Dr. Gordney of the Institute arranged for an investigation of the case. Dr. Thelma Moss, a co-worker, and Dr. Gertrude Schmeidler, a psychologist at City College in New York, worked together on a plan. Dr. Schmeidler had tried a new method of investigation with another haunted house, and Dr. Moss decided to follow a similar idea. The plan was carried out with the cooperation of members of the American Society for Psychical Research. Dr. Moss and Dr. Schmeidler did not actually go to the house. In this way, they hoped to be able to report the results more objectively. The Himes were anxious for a solution to the problem and gave full cooperation to the scientists. First, the ASPR members interviewed separately each of the four people who had seen the strange man. Their descriptions were somewhat similar. Dr. Moss made up a list of words that described a variety of physical appearances and personality traits. Within this list were scattered the words the four witnesses had used to describe the man and his personality. Also, a diagram was drawn up of the room plan of each floor of the house and the surrounding grounds. Sixteen people were chosen to fill out a form choosing the words that best described the ghost of the man and those words that were most unlike the man. They were also asked to check the places on the house plans where the ghost might have been seen. Eight of these people were chosen as what are called control subjects. They had never been to the house, knew nothing about it. They were simply told that a male ghost had been reported at the house. Each control subject was taken through the house by an ASPR member and asked to fill out the forms as if he could imagine seeing a male ghost there. The second group of eight people had one quality in common. They were all reported to have unusual psychic abilities. They could at times give accurate information about people whom they did not know, suggest events that might actually occur later, or relate accurate information that they felt came from persons who were no longer living. These individuals, who seem to be in contact with a world unknown to most people, are psychics. The eight sensitives were taken separately to the Himes house by an ASPR worker. They had been told nothing about the details of the reports of the ghost. Each sensitive was free to walk anywhere in the house or on the grounds and to form impressions of what the ghost might have been like, or where it may have been appearing. On their individual excursions, each sensitive described some perception of a personality. One reported seeing a girl near the pool, where there was no one there. The other sensitives gave various descriptions of a man, specifying his personality and activity. In addition to the eight control subjects and eight sensitives, the forms were also given to the four eyewitnesses to fill out. Then, all the forms were compared. As was expected, the descriptions given by the control subject had little in common with the descriptions given by the four witnesses. Of the forms submitted by the eight sensitives, two were not used because they were not filled out correctly. 
of the forms submitted by the other six sensitives, only three showed a high similarity to those of the witnesses. Even among the witnesses, some of the descriptions did not agree. But there was enough agreement between the three sensitives and some of the witnesses' checklists to show that at least these three sensitives had sensed a ghost, much like the man who had been reported earlier. It turned out that the description of the girl seen by the pool fitted that of a girl whom Mrs. Hyams had known in Europe, who had died recently. In some ways, the ghost of the man was like a doctor with whom Mr. Hyams had done some work, and who had also recently died. The ghost also seemed somewhat like Mrs. Hyams' father, who had died some time earlier. During the course of the investigation, one of the sensitives reported her impressions that there was going to be a fire in the house, possibly in about six months, but not necessarily that soon. She thought that it would be raining when the fire broke out, and she also predicted that Mr. and Mrs. Hyams would move out of the house within two years. Early in the morning of March 13, 1967, during an unusual California rainstorm, fire did break out in the Hyams' house. Mr. and Mrs. Adams were awakened by a loud pounding on their bedroom door. When Mr. Hyams opened it, there was nothing but smoke. He and his wife crawled out of a window to safety, and they later found out that the fire had started in the mysterious dining room. True to the prediction, Mr. and Mrs. Himes moved out of the house and put it up for sale. The mystery of the ghost, the fire, and the warning pounding on the bedroom door were left behind. The House in Beach Bluff by Dimetime99 I've had a few experiences with the unexplained, but this, by far, was the worst paranormal experience I've ever had. Many moons ago, I moved in with a good friend whose house was way out on the sticks of this weird gravel road. My friend did tell me that his house may be haunted because of the history of it and because of strange things that he had been seeing and hearing. He didn't believe in ghosts and the paranormal as much as I did, so he didn't pay much attention to anything moving and any strange sounds. The day I moved in, he told me about the history of the house. He told me that a family of three, a mother, father, and daughter, lived in the house when the house was first built years ago. Their daughter committed suicide in her bedroom upstairs, the only room upstairs. And several years after the mother and father moved out of the house, a few families bought and sold it until my friend's parents bought it as a fixer-upper. And they began remodeling it. The stairs were removed and the second story was completely sealed off and a drop ceiling was put in to cover the old ceiling and cover the opening to the top floor. My friend's parents were aware of the history of the house, so I assumed that was the reason they removed the stairs and installed a drop ceiling. I've never been in a house that had such a strange layout or floor plan. The living room and two bedrooms were in the front of the house. The dining room was on the other side of the living room wall, and the kitchen was behind the dining room at the back of the house. The one bathroom was at the end of a long hallway. And that was it, just a long hallway with a bathroom at the end of it. Anyway, when I first started noticing little things out of place and odd sounds, it was kind of cool and fascinating. We would hear footsteps down the hallway, and we would hear things moving. Things would fall off of the kitchen counters. You know, nothing alarming, and most of the activity happened in the daytime. But things started happening more often, and it slowly started to annoy us. The activity was now happening day and night. My friend and I started distancing ourselves from the house by partying all night and crashing wherever we passed out. We would stay at our parents' or grandparents' houses. All of this back and forth from friends' houses to parents' houses, drinking and partying all the time had worn me out, and I needed a break. That's when I decided to head out to that house, just for some alone time, some peace and quiet. We hadn't been out there for days, and I figured if I watched a movie at a high volume or listened to some music loudly, I wouldn't hear anything and I'd be fine. If I got bored with watching movies or TV, I'd go jump on my drum kit and jam out. But little did I know that the shit was about to hit the fan. I was sitting there all alone just watching TV. Our TV was hooked up to a stereo so we could watch movies and listen to music as loud as we wanted. I was watching some show, and the stereo cut off. We had an entertainment center that held the TV, stereo, a few lamps, and a clock, etc. But suddenly the stereo cut off, but the TV and everything else that was in there in the entertainment center stayed on, even though all of the devices were plugged into the same power strip. There was dead silence, and that's when I began to hear whispering like several people whispering all at once. 
The whispering was coming from the kitchen, which I mentioned was at the back of the house. It kept getting louder and louder until I had to go outside to see if the whispering was my mind playing tricks on me. But it was quiet outside. And no whispering. There was a storm coming, so I did hear thunder, but no whispering. As soon as I got comfortable, I heard the whispering around the side of the house, and it was gradually getting louder. <sighs> Dang, I had to go back inside. But it was quiet. And then, bob boom as loud as hell, a clap of thunder. I mean, it scared the heck out of me. After cringing from the tremendous thunderclap, I relaxed and started down the hall to the bathroom. The hallway always made me uncomfortable. It was a long one that went to the bathroom, like I said, nothing else. I started down the hallway when I heard this creaking sound directly behind me. As I turned my head, I saw from the corner of my eye the front door slowly creaking open, and something I can only explain as the fight-or-flight response told me to shut the damn door right then. So I dove towards the door, sliding across the floor in my stomach, crashing right into it, slamming it shut. I remember feeling like all of that happened in slow motion. Anyway, I slid across the floor, slammed the door shut, and then jumped up and had the most intense feeling that someone or something was right behind me. You know when someone's trying to sneak up on you and you get this bizarre feeling that someone or something is right there? I don't know the best way to describe that feeling, but it's just not a good feeling. Anyway, it was more than a feeling that something was just behind me. I mean, whatever it was, it felt angry or enraged, and it wanted to hurt me. It honestly felt like I was about to be violently attacked from behind by who knows what. I mean, this feeling was so intense that I closed my eyes, bent down, and tensed up, preparing for an attack. Then nothing. The feeling was gone. I quickly turned around expecting to catch a glimpse of my attacker, but there was nothing there. After realizing that I was alone, I grabbed my wallet, my hat, and keys, and I left. When I came back, I packed up my belongings and moved out, and I rented a U-Haul so I could just get all of my stuff out of there in one trip. I've witnessed several paranormal events in my life, but this one was the worst. All the other paranormal experiences I've witnessed haven't been that bad, but there have been a handful of experiences that weren't cool at all. I will never forget any of the paranormal activity I've witnessed throughout my life, especially this one. True Urban Legend, submitted by Rhett S. My name is Rhett, and I've always been interested in the paranormal. Years ago, I looked up and found haunted areas around me, and I found an elementary school down the road from where I live. I won't name the city I live in, nor the name of the school due to fear of the school getting harassed, but I promise this is true. One night in September, I went down to the school to investigate. I got onto the playground, which was obviously in an open ground. I spent about 45 minutes walking around the track and swinging on the swings, and then I began to hear noises coming from the inside of the school, which sounded like someone slamming lockers. Believing it was a cleaning crew and not wanting to be on the grounds after hours, I mean, it was 12.40 at night, I left. The following summer, my cousin was visiting, and we found ourselves telling ourselves ghost stories. I told him about the school, and we went out there. This time it was a Saturday night in June so I wasn't worried about a cleaning crew, despite there being a car in the parking lot. We went to the playground, and right off the bat, my cousin informed me that someone was in the playground. I turned to my left and saw someone with their cell phone, and I could see their cell phone because the background was glowing like he had just called somebody. I watched as the man got into his car in the parking lot, started it, and left. I stressed the man part because my cousin is now convinced that we just saw a ghost. His reasons were we would have seen him walking around and not just when he was leaving. To prove his point, my cousin walked around the park with my cell phone, and despite the fact I could see my cousin with a cell phone, it still didn't prove the fact that what we had seen was a ghost. We got back together and began to argue if what we had seen was a ghost or not. I said no, but he was convinced that the guy we had just seen drive away was a ghost. I told my cousin, look, if it was a ghost... We wouldn't have seen the phone, nor him drive away. As I asked my cousin if he was an idiot, I heard a little girl's laughter coming from behind my cousin's left shoulder. On the inside, I was flipping out, though I kept my composure because my cousin was already flipping out. Then my cousin turned and looked over his left shoulder, 
and I asked him if he had heard that, and he said yes. I asked him what he heard and where it came from. He confirmed what I already knew. He'd heard a little girl laughing at him, and it was coming from behind him. As we looked around, all we saw was a tree. And we looked around the park and saw no one there with us after the guy left when we first got there. Also, there was nowhere anyone could have gone to hide or leave without us seeing them. Yeah, it was nighttime, but we were standing by the only entrance exit that there was. I told my cousin that the school was haunted, but I never told him what had happened. The story is, there was a little girl who died in a freak accident while in a merry-go-round. And I've never really confirmed that, hence why I don't want to give out the school's name. Apparently, she slipped one day while on the merry-go-round, and either she had her neck snapped or her head come clean off. Over the years, there had been reports of seeing a little girl standing by a tree. We didn't see her by a tree, but we did hear her. This was back in 2009, and my cousin and I hardly talk nowadays, but when we do, the subject of that little ghost girl and her laugh always gets brought up. It haunts us both to this day. The White Rocking Chair by Anonymous So, this is a true story, and it actually happened to my mom. It may seem unbelievable, but it really did happen. My mom had a loving relationship with her grandma, and loved to visit her as a child until her unfortunate passing. However, strange things happened to her when she used to visit her house and to her grandma. In one instance, they were gardening together when footprints appeared in the freshly sowed soil. My mom's aunt moved into this house after my mom's grandma had passed. And then my aunt passed away recently, unfortunately. So my mom was there helping her uncle with selling stuff from the house and having a garage sale. She just called while on her way home and told me this. While selling some stuff, she suddenly saw this white rocking chair, and there was a small boy about ten rocking in the chair very hard. He had brown hair, and my mom walked by and said something like, Having fun in that rocking chair? to which the little boy looked at her very angrily and replied, It's haunted. My mom laughed and said, Really? How do you know? And the little boy said, It's haunted. I can feel it. And then he walked off, and my mom couldn't find him. It was as if he had disappeared. She asked one of the other people helping if they saw the boy, and they said no, which was reasonable since there were a lot of people walking around. She then looked around and then asked where the white rocking chair was, and everyone replied, What chair? The other two people who stayed in that house also said weird things were happening all night. I mean, I'm sorry, but what chair? What kind of answer is that? Heck no. I mean, this is all horror movie material, and all I'm saying is that I do not care how much family history we have in this house. I will never be visiting it ever again. Nope, nope, nope. Nope. With a capital nope. The Manor House Ghost In 1964, the cameras of the National Broadcasting Company were taken to England to attempt the filming of a TV special on famous haunted houses. The name of the program, The Stately Ghosts of England, was based on the name of a book that had been written about the houses. One of the most interesting old homes was the manor house called Longleat. The television team interviewed people who had seen or heard ghosts in the house, and they also tried to photograph the locations where the ghosts had been reported, with some strange results. The Marquis of Bath, whose ancestors who had lived in the house, gave the account of a ghost called the Green Lady. A family portrait of her shows a lady in a green gown. Her name was Lady Louisa Carteret, and one of Lord Bath's ancestors had married her in 1735. However, the marriage did not go well. Lady Louisa met a young man at a dance given at Longleat and fell in love with him. In a hall on the third floor of the house, Louisa's husband fought a duel with her lover and killed him. Within a short time, Lady Louisa herself died of a broken heart, and the third-floor hall where the duel occurred is the place where the strange things have been noticed. Even servants of the house would go out of their way to avoid walking through that section. The NBC crew set up cameras to photograph the third-floor area, and from the very beginning they had mysterious problems. Roll after roll of color film was developed and showed nothing at all but yellowish or greenish haze. New cameras were brought in, and new film stock was tried, with no better results. 
Automatic equipment had been set up to shoot film footage during the night. It would be found inexplicably shut off the following morning. The tapes from tape recorders were also as bad as the muddy films. Unusual accidents also began to occur. By itself, a reflector floodlight rolled out of a bedroom, down a hall, hit a banister, then fell over it to crash to the open stairwell. It almost hit an NBC crew member. Other lights blew up, and telephones went dead. It was reported that during an attempt to film a grandfather clock striking midnight, every other clock in the house struck the hour, except the one that was being photographed. A crew member made some sharp remarks about the clock, and the next day he had an automobile accident. Finally, the film director tried a new approach. As strange as he felt about it, he walked into the third floor hall and said to the ghosts, I believe you're doing this. If you want me to ask your permission, I do humbly ask that you permit us to put this story on film. After that, the trouble stopped, and a special camera on the third floor filmed a most unusual sequence. This camera had been set up to take shots automatically at intervals during the night, and when the time-lapse shots were developed, there was a sequence in slow motion. It showed a light like an automobile headlight, coming out one door, moving down the hall, and then disappearing behind another door. No one could figure out any logical explanation for the light, as all other windows had been blacked out. The rest of the filming was completed without any unusual difficulty. In the TV special, The Stately Ghosts of England, complete with the movie of the mysterious moving light, was broadcast on January 25, 1965. Sister's Phone Call by Eros In December of 1990, I was living in New York City trying to make it in the rock music industry. The last time I saw my sister, Dully, was the year before when she visited us. One morning as I was getting ready for my day job, I received the phone call no brother ever wants to receive. It was my mother saying three words I will never forget. Todd, she's gone. And so began my new life, the life where my beautiful sister was no longer on this earth. Deli was one of those rare people that everyone loved. She had an incredible caring soul. I know we tend to only remember the positives about people and conveniently forget the negatives when a person dies, but I can honestly say my sister didn't have very many negative qualities. She was a soft, sweet, caring soul that was apparently only meant to walk this earth for 25 years in this incarnation. She cared deeply for me and nurtured me almost like a second mom, and we were very close. We'd both grown up in an abusive home after our parents divorced, and when my mother remarried, our teen years were spent in a volatile home thanks to our stepdad, which is why it wasn't any surprise looking back now that even in death she wanted to take care of me by letting me know that she was okay. Now at the time, I didn't know who was trying to call. It all started when I was alone in the apartment one night, not long after her accident. It was exactly midnight when the phone rang, and I know this because I had a digital clock next to me with those big red digital display numbers. I picked up the phone and heard what sounded like this loud white noise, like TV static back in the day when you would turn the channel and it was just a static screen. So I said, hello, hello, and nothing. Not thinking much of it, I hung up and went back to bed. Then the phone rang again. I looked at the clock, and it was now 12.15 a.m., same thing on the phone. Loud static. Living in NYC at the time, I started thinking maybe it was a bandmate calling from a subway station and a train was going by as they called. But I never did hear anything other than static. Every time I would go back to bed, like clockwork, literally, every 15 minutes on the dot, the phone would ring. 12.30, 12.45, 1 a.m., 1.15, and so on. At this point, I just knew it was my sister. Goosebumps came over me, and that knowing only you can quantify without knowing how it is, you know something. I mean, you just do. This went on at precise 15-minute increments until the final phone call at 3 a.m., and then it stopped for good. At the time, I didn't know about spirits using the phone sometimes to try to contact loved ones from beyond. But then I came across a book a few years later that described my experience nearly to a T. I'm not sure why she was unable to make her voice audible above the white noise, 
happening, perhaps her soul was too new to the other dimension and wasn't able to project enough energy. I mean, no matter. In the end, I know it was her trying to tell me she was okay. I had many wonderful contact dreams from her in the following few years after her passing. Then at one point, I attended a psychic reading with a panel of respected psychics from the northeast region of the U.S. They were providing readings using psychometry. I brought the framed photo Dully had given me of herself just a year before she passed, which, if you knew my sister, that in and of herself was an incredible feat, as she hated her photo being taken. But inexplicably, she had portraits of herself taken that she had given to her closest family and friends not long before her accident. I mean, that alone still blows my mind. I raised my hand and offered the framed photo to the row of psychics, and the information they provided me was nothing short of astounding. The feeling of cold signifying the person is no longer in the earth realm. Yes. The passing was due to a car accident involving a large truck of some sort. <laughs> yeah, she was killed instantly on a rainy evening coming home and didn't even see the semi-truck that was parked half in the road for mechanical trouble. Her death was quick. She showed them the lights out, meaning that she didn't suffer. True. She was with a father figure, and they were holding hands. The father figure had heart trouble of some sort causing his death. This was also correct. My father died six months after Dully in a car accident, and we believe it was a broken heart that caused the accident. I always gravitated towards the unknown and the paranormal, but my interest in spirituality, metaphysics, consciousness, and life after death didn't accelerate until after they had both died. In the years since, I've had a full-blown awakening, and my sister gets all the credit. While I still am struggling with the human part of myself, and far from perfect, all of the good within me and my desire to always strive to be a better father, husband, friend, son, and man is due to her influence, both while she was still on the earth and even now in the afterlife. The day we are reunited again will be one sweet day indeed. Haunted House, submitted by Jennifer Y. My family has an old farmhouse that's been kind of handed down for generations. It was built outside a little town in Indiana called Seymour, about 70 miles from Indianapolis. My great-grandfather built it and the barn in 1882, and both still stand today, albeit the farmhouse has been renovated and updated. It's where I live now with my husband and teenage son and daughter. The farmland that my great-grandfather and grandfather ran was sold a long time ago as no one in the family, including my dad, wanted to make their living that way. When my grandparents decided to move to Arizona, they gave the farmhouse to my dad, sold all but about 20 acres of grassland and some trees surrounding the house. This is kind of a complicated story because no one can figure out why the things happening in the farmhouse were going on, but they started when my dad was about 12 years old, and as best as we can tell, there's a reason for why the things have happened. As farmers, the family got up very early and worked very late, and I think that's why the guy we think is the cause of the disturbances stumbled to our house. In the spring of 1956, my grandfather, uncles, and father were working in the barn late one night trying to repair a tractor. My mother and aunt had gone to bed as they were charged with getting up early and making breakfast before morning chores and then all the kids having to go to school. And that's when this guy showed up, a man that I will call Stephen. Stephen had been in a bad automobile accident about half a mile up our road. At a high rate of speed, his car jumped railroad tracks, and he flew off the road and into some trees. He was injured badly. He had a broken arm and split the back of his head open. Somehow, he crawled or walked his way to the only light he saw, and that was the light in our barn. He got onto our front porch and started knocking and asking for help. My grandmother came down and answered the door, and then screamed at this bloody man leaning against the door. My aunt had followed her down, of course also screamed too, and then ran to the phone as there was an extension out to the barn. This man, Stephen, kept saying he was sorry, and that he wanted to go home, as my aunt told him that help was coming. The menfolk came running, and my grandfather called the sheriff. My dad and uncles were trying to keep Stephen awake, and talked about how they could get him to the medical center in town. Sadly, Stephen was bleeding badly, and before they could get him to a flatbed or the sheriff to come out, he died right on our porch. The last thing he said was, Why didn't you help me? I mean, that was odd. Everyone was doing everything they could to help him. 
Later in life, my dad always said that Stephen was a goner way before he got to our house. There was really nothing we could do. The sheriff and an ambulance came out and took him away, and they also found his mangled car. It wasn't until about a month later after everything had settled down and my dad and uncle stopped having bad dreams about the guy that strange things began to happen. For a couple of weeks, something would bang on the front door of the house right around the same time Stephen had first shown up on the porch. Every time someone went to check, there was no one there. This happened on and off for years and even into when I was growing up in the house. One night around 1987, there was a violent thunderstorm and my brother and I were home alone. We lost power and put out candles and made sure all the windows were closed. But after about an hour of high winds and crazy rain, things subsided, and we heard the pounding on the front door. My brother ran to it and opened it, and that was not a good move. The storm door ripped open and a huge blast of air came rushing past us, and it was not Mother Nature. The next thing we knew, the two front windows that looked out onto the porch flew open. I mean, we'd lock them securely as our parents always told us to do in a storm. As we stood looking at each other, the rush of wind came back and ripped past us and went up the stairs to the second floor. How do I know? There was a one step up before the stairs turned left, and it went on upstairs, and a window, which was closed, had some curtains on it, and they blew straight upward. My brother and I then heard a loud bang from upstairs as if a door had been slammed shut. Scared, but also curious, we went upstairs with candles and saw that the only door that was shut was our spare room. There was nothing in there but our Commodore 64 and my mom's sewing machine and accessories. I'll mention that there were four bedrooms upstairs, off of one open landing, and a door to the walk-up attic. Those were all open. We didn't open the spare room door. By the time my parents got home, the power was back on and we told them what had happened. My dad didn't say a word and ran right upstairs and flung the door open. We all followed and stood behind him as he stared into the room. Everything was a mess. The only thing that wasn't upset was the desk our computer sat on. But the spare bed, my mom's sewing table, the bodice mannequin, the armchair, all of it was thrown all over the place. That was the weird part. we never heard any of that happening, not one sound. But there all these things were, tossed about. My dad turned around and told us to go back downstairs, and he went to my parents' room and called somebody. It was our pastor. My parents, unlike me, were really into our religion. I'm still going to church, and I still believe and have a faith, but I was not into it the way my parents were. I don't know what my dad and the pastor talked about, but our pastor did come out the next day after my parents said to stay out of the room. My mom did put things back in order after he came over the next day, but things seemed to get worse. One morning, we all came down for breakfast, and all of the kitchen cupboards had been opened and the contents stacked on the floor of the kitchen table. Foodstuffs were spilled all over the place, and it was a giant mess. I actually stayed home from school that day to help my mom clean up. Then came the knocking in the walls. At night, there was a loud knocking in all of our bedroom walls, but not at the same time. The first time I heard it, my dad woke up and I could hear him walking around the house trying to find the source of the bumps, but every time he went into a room, the knocking would happen in another part of the house. This went on for a few nights, and I could tell my dad was getting pissed. He called our pastor again, and this time he came out and said some prayers with us and blessed the house. Things subsided and nothing really happened again until 1990 when I was a senior in high school. I was a cheerleader, and our big football game with our rival school was coming up as part of our homecoming. My mom and I made sure that my uniform was all set to go the night before, but when I went to get it, it was not where we left it. Frantic, okay, I know, I'm being dramatic about it. This was a big deal to me back then. We looked around everywhere, but couldn't find my spankies, my skirt, or my sweater. Right before it was time for us to leave, we heard a loud thump coming from that spare room. And when we went to look, there, on a chair, was my stuff. I had to get dressed, and my mom and I didn't talk about it until we were well on our way to the game. Neither of us had been in that room for days. Later that night, the window to that room kept opening and closing loudly. I mean, it would slam open and slam shut. It happened at least five times before my dad lost it, went down to the basement and got some big carpenter nails and then nailed it shut. 
More things happened after I went to college, but my parents didn't talk a lot about it. They kept having people from the church over to bless the place, and it always seemed to get things quiet for a time. Fast forward to last year. The house became ours, and my husband started working from home during COVID, and I was still running a jewelry business from home. Our kids were also doing instruction at home, and they had never heard any of these stories before, and nothing had ever happened while they were home. But in April of last year, things did start happening again. At first it was little things. Just strange sounds, the knocking in the walls, doors opening and closing, and lights turning on and off by themselves. But then came the footsteps at night. From our bedroom, my husband and I could hear a knock on the front door, and then footsteps walking on the porch, and then also walking around downstairs. Whenever we checked, there was no one there. One late afternoon, my husband and I ran out to Walmart and Home Depot to get the supplies we needed. We were running a little late. It was about 10 after 10 when we got home. My son was sitting in the living room with our daughter who was crying. She ran over to me and hugged me and told me about this awful man on the porch who kept knocking on the door. He was covered in blood and she said he kept asking why we didn't help him. As I mentioned, my kids had never heard the story about that guy from the 50s. No one ever wrote it down and no one ever spoke about it. I calmed the kids down and then made some popcorn for a movie night distraction and told them that it was nothing, and they were probably just imagining things. I calmed the kids down and then made some popcorn for a movie night distraction and told them that they were probably just imagining things and maybe they were watching too many scary movies. After the kids went to sleep, my husband and I talked about it, and he said maybe another visit from our pastor was in order. Like I said, I believe and have my faith, but I'm not as into the church as my father was. I agreed and we planned to call Reverend Jim the next day. It was really late and I was switching off the lights when there came a knock on the front door. My husband went to it, opened it, and stood staring. Then I ran over and there on the porch was a man who looked all bloody standing a few feet from the door. He looked right at us and I was holding back a scream but I knew he wasn't a living being as I could sort of see through him. He quietly asked, Why didn't you help me? And my husband quietly said back, They did try to help you, but you were already gone. You need to go now. There's nothing else we can do. This ghost, or whatever you want to call it, looked at us, looked down, and then just faded away. We closed the door and held on to each other for a long time, and the next day we did call our pastor and told him what happened. He came out saying he could only stay on the porch due to COVID and all the other people he had to see as part of his church leadership safety reasons. He said some prayers with us, and afterward, he said he had a strange feeling that there was someone else there with us lying on the porch, but was gone when we finished praying. I asked him if he believed in ghosts, and he said the only ghost he believed in was the Holy Ghost, but something still was bothering him there. Reverend Jim said goodbye, and nothing has happened since. We've spoken with him at church services, and so much of the band stuff has been lifted, and while we don't talk about it with our kids, We're sure that the man is gone and someplace else. I think maybe he was just looking for someone to say something to him for all those years. And when we finally did, he finally found peace. The Ghost in Chicago by Worthwise In the summer of 2009, I was visiting Chicago for a work trip and stayed at the historic Hilton Chicago across from Grant Park. My sister also lives in Chicago, and my trip coincided with her bachelorette party. After work on a Friday evening, I had dinner with my sister and two of her friends. I distinctly remember only having one glass of wine at dinner, since the next night would likely include more drinking at the bachelorette party. After dinner, I went back to the hotel and fell asleep. While sleeping, I started having a vivid dream. I was stuck in an elevator. The elevator stopped working, and I tried using the intercom to call the operator. The operator started screaming at me through the intercom. It sounded like a cacophony of multiple voices screaming. Suddenly I woke up, my heart racing. And that's when I realized being stuck in the elevator was a dream, and the voices that were screaming at me were actually coming from the hallway. A group of people walking through the hallway were being ridiculously loud. 
Reality hit me that I had been woken up, and I remember feeling very annoyed and thinking I probably wouldn't be able to fall back asleep. I was curled up in a fetal position on my right side, and I flipped over to my left side so I could see the time on the digital clock. It was 4 a.m. I sighed, feeling anxious about whether or not I'd be able to fall back asleep, and then I then rolled over from the fetal position onto my back. And that's when I saw it. Standing at the foot of the bed, directly in front of me, was a man. This man was not completely solid, but more solid than an apparition. I could make out every single detail on this man's face, but there was definitely a low-key glow radiating through him. To this day, I could spot this man in a lineup. His hair was reddish and thinning, high cheekbones, faint mustache, and a pointy nose. He was wearing a cut-off Celtics jersey, and he was staring at me and smiling slightly. Creepy in a, I'm standing in your hotel room staring at you creepy way, but not overly creepy. I did not sense this person to be evil, but I was still scared. We stared at each other for what felt like five minutes, but was probably ten or twenty seconds. My thought process during this time went something like, did one of those people in the hallway break into my room? No, this doesn't feel like a real person. This feels like a ghost. Maybe it's my guardian angel. Shouldn't my guardian angel be wearing something nicer than a cut-off jersey? Am I having one of those sleep paralysis moments? Can I move? If it's a ghost, wouldn't he have left by now? He's still staring at me. It must be a real person. Oh my god, there's a real person in here. At that moment, I decided the person was real. I sat up in bed and screamed while staring directly at this guy. And all of a sudden, right before my eyes, he just faded away. Almost like pixels dissolving into the air. I was still sitting in the same spot, breathing heavily. While sitting there, I started looking around the room because I was still confused about what had just happened. The door to the bathroom was slightly ajar, and as I looked into the dark doorway, I saw his face again, staring right back at me. We locked eyes, and then once again, he just faded away like pixels. I had never been so scared in my life. I felt incapable of moving or doing anything. I really was that scared. I curled up under the bed covers completely awake for the next hour. Eventually, I grabbed my cell phone off the nightstand and called my boyfriend, now husband. It was 6 a.m. in New York at that point, and he didn't answer. Eventually, I got up and went to yoga in the park with my boss that morning and told her the entire story. Then I asked two different hotel employees if they ever heard any stories, and they said no. I can't imagine that is true given the historic nature of the hotel. Later that morning, I talked to my boyfriend, now husband, and he said it was probably a remote viewer who was just having some fun getting into different hotel rooms. I don't know what it was, but I know it happened. Friend Visits My Haunted House by Cole H. The area I live in is one of the oldest in my country. It dates back to the late 1600s. The history of the region as a whole is rather blood-soaked, and the city itself is notorious for its hauntings. My home was built in the early 1900s, making one of the oldest in my section of the town. The only buildings that are older date back to the 16 to 1700s. My home has two sets of staircases, a more ornate staircase at the front of the home, obviously meaning to impress guests. The other is a steep, dark, fully enclosed set of stairs at the back of the house a staircase that is obviously meant for servants. It even leads from the kitchen, which has a butler's pantry, to the second floor of the home. My house even had a carriage barn in the back. My father had to tear the barn down when I was a kid, as it had become dangerously unstable, and there was just no saving it. The foundation, however, is still there. I have a friend that I hang out with pretty regularly, and she has had paranormal experiences. While we don't consider ourselves mediums or anything, we do consider ourselves a bit more open to the world around us than most people are. A few months ago, she came over to my house for the first time. 
There was a concert going on in a nearby park that we were planning on attending. We met at my house because the concert was outdoors and it was too hot to meet at the event. So we met at my house, had dinner, and had my mother drive us down. When she got to my place, the first thing she did was marvel at just how heavy the air in my house felt. She said it felt like the house was welcoming her in. We had a good hour or two before we had to get ready, and she had heard all about my experiences. So I took her through the home and showed her where the hot spots were. I took her everywhere, from my old bedroom to the upstairs bathroom. I mean everywhere, even the basement. I even went so far as to point out all the pieces of furniture we had in the basement that my grandfather had made before his death in the 90s. While we were walking around, my friend kept remarking on how heavy the air felt, how she felt like she was being watched, and how the atmosphere seemed to shift and change depending on what we were talking about. Shortly before dinner, we went down to the basement so my friend could throw something in my washer. She had gotten a stain on her clothes earlier in the day. So being pressed for time, she simply brought a change of clothes and asked if she could wash her clothes at my house. While she was standing at the washer, she mentioned that she felt like there was something standing right behind her, staring over her shoulder. Something that I had felt so often down there, that I had actually grown used to. She said that it didn't so much feel threatening, just that whatever was down there wanted us to leave. We went upstairs to sit in my living room and talk while we waited for her laundry to finish. While we were talking, I realized there were two places on my property that I had had experiences that I hadn't shown to my friend. So I got up to took her to those places. The first place was my back stairs. The second she walked through the door that led to the back door, her demeanor started to change. She went from smiling and joking around to scared and saying that she was starting to not feel well. So we left the back stairs and went back to the living room. I took her to the backyard as well, but nothing really happened, and again, it was too hot to stay outside. My friend started talking about how she felt like there were at least familial presences in the house, which makes sense. We have a memorial statue for a baby my parents lost shortly after birth, sitting on our porch, and we have a lot of family heirlooms in the house. But then she said something that left me pretty shaken. She looked me dead in the eye and told me that whatever familiar presences were in the home, as well as whatever entities were there, were almost certainly protecting my family and I for whatever was up the back stairs. It was just after she said that, that we both felt the very air around us change. It was like the spirits were telling us to stop talking about them. It was at that moment that we both realized that even though the good spirits in my home were protecting us, they didn't like people talking about them at length. They were the sort of spirits that wanted to be acknowledged and then left alone. As soon as we came to that realization, I pulled out my phone and started texting a mutual friend of ours. I had been planning on doing a bit of ghost hunting around my house to celebrate the coming Halloween season. We were never going to do anything beyond sneak around my house at night and scare ourselves shitless. But our mutual friend had purchased a couple of pieces of actual equipment and was acting a little eager. We had originally been planning on doing a little adventuring to celebrate the coming of fall and the start of spooky season. I mean, we all loved Halloween. I was planning on telling her and anyone else that we had with us something along these lines. No ghost hunting equipment is to be brought into my house. No EVP stuff, no EMF gauges, no digital audio recorders, etc. Cameras are okay, but if I tell you to not record in a certain area, I'm going to expect you to respect my wishes. I was going to make it so the rules would be as clear and easy to follow as possible. I realized that if I let her anywhere near my house, this friend would most likely get overexcited and ignore the rules that I was planning on putting in place. By doing so, she might unleash something that I wouldn't be able to stop. I ended up canceling the entire hunt out of an overabundance of caution, and I unfortunately had to tell this person I was texting that I didn't think it would be a good idea for her to come over at all. I mean, ever. I feel like I dodged a major bullet. But I also feel like I'm now responsible for protecting people from my house, as well as protecting my house from people looking to take advantage of the situation. It's important to note that in the days after my friend came over, the air in the house felt lighter, almost like the spirits were thanking us for acknowledging them. 
I've also taken to quietly announcing myself and my intentions whenever I go down to the basement. I usually say something along the lines of, Hello, I'm just coming down here to deal with my laundry. I'm not here to disturb you. I'll be leaving the basement as soon as I'm finished with my chore. This is something small that has helped with the overbearing feeling a great deal. The Coincidence is Too Close, by Astronaut Zero. Everything that happened in this recount was over the years we all lived with my mom. I tell people this in person, but couldn't think of where to post it. In April 2012, we moved from one side of town to the other, a simple house swap which is common in the UK. We moved in quickly and settled in pretty quickly too. A few weeks went by and we had nothing to note. It just seemed normal. Six months there, and my sister started talking about the ghost that lives in the house and how she's called it Kevin. We all laughed about it, even her, because we hadn't seen or heard anything that would suggest a haunting. One night I was playing on my PS4 with my brother, probably called Duty. The game is irrelevant. We heard our sister screaming to my stepdad asking, Did you just throw my remote at me? We laughed, but were intrigued, so we asked her what the fuck she was shouting about. She explained that she was doing homework, and then her door opened and her Xbox controller was thrown at her from the other side of the room. She didn't use the controller, so this was a little strange, but we just told her she was being stupid and went back to gaming. A couple of nights went by, and the same thing happened again. The controller was thrown, and she was shouting at my stepdad. He then said back, why the fuck would I get up, go upstairs to your room, throw your controller at you, come back downstairs and carry on watching TV? She was confused by it and just said, Then this house is actually haunted if nobody did it. I decided to chill out and watch TV with my stepdad that night. I wasn't at school the next day, weekends, so I was up until 3 a.m.-ish, and at about 2 a.m. we were just getting through a film we heard what sounded like someone walking across the landing to the toilet, and then to the top of the stairs. My bedroom door was right at the top of the stairs, so I shouted up, Get out of my room! My mom went to bed around 10 or 11, so she shouted down, Nobody's there! What are you talking about? My stepdad said back, We just heard someone walk to the toilet and then walk to the top of the stairs. The exchange went on for a couple of minutes and finished with, whatever, from both ends of the conversation. The walking noises kept happening. One morning soon after the controller incidents, my sister asked if anyone came to her room in the early hours. She'd seen a black figure in her doorway watching her. None of us knew what she was talking about, and that's when Kevin was mentioned more frequently. On occasions, my mom would ask if anyone had walked past her because she felt breathing on her neck. I always said, probably Kevin. She laughed it off, but I could tell she didn't want to admit there might be a ghost. That night I was in bed watching Family Guy or some other shit TV program, and I saw a white figure in my doorway, even though my doorway was closed before I went to bed. I turned my TV off, rolled over, and went to sleep. I couldn't see it. Couldn't be bothered to deal with it. The appearances never happened again after that, but the walking never stopped, and it was always between 2 and 2.30 a.m. We eventually just blocked out the noise, and it didn't really affect us too much. Two years ago, we experienced something that has changed how I look at the house forever. I've moved out since, but I know this house is haunted because of this event. My stepdad was on his way out with his mates to go do some repairs for one of them, and a man walked past them and just stood around looking at the houses. They all drove off, and he stayed still. My mom, who saw my stepdad off, saw the man and asked if he was with them, and the conversation went like this. Oh, no, I used to live here in the haunted house. Which one, my mom replied, and he pointed to our house. My mom then said, why is it haunted? And he told her, well, the family that lived there had a daughter who was murdered by her boyfriend. Her bedroom was at the end of the landing. That was my sister's room. 
My mom then told them that we already knew the house was haunted and that my sister called it Kevin. He chuckled and told her, No, the ghost is called Vicky. Her brother is called Kevin. He said his farewells, but just before he left, my mom got the surname of the family from him. My mom recognized the surname because while she was growing up, there was an elderly couple that lived near her with the same surname. She phoned her auntie and asked about the family, and she told my mom, Yeah, they used to live there, but they moved because they lost their daughter, and they didn't like it there because of the bad memory. And then they moved to where my mom grew up. Something Wrong at Our New House, submitted by Dan W. This all began when my wife and I decided to build a new house rather than buy an existing one. We did a lot of research as to where we wanted to build our permanent home and found a great spot in a new limited subdivision. When I say limited, I don't think that's a technical real estate term, but it was a one street neighborhood surrounded by forestry. We were going to live at the very end and had three acres in our backyard and off to the side, which was a little bit larger than most of our neighbors' yards. Part of the reason that we wanted the place in the first place. It was exciting to be doing the project from the ground up, working with the architects and their design people. The whole process took months, and I spent a lot of time after work and on weekends popping out to look at the progress and meet with contractors and that sort of thing. Soon we had our house, as other houses were going up in the neighborhood too. I'll take a few seconds and describe the house for the rest of the story. There was a main foyer with a large staircase after the foyer in our front hall when you entered. Off to the right was my home office and library. Off to the left was our formal living room that opened up into our dining room. The dining room and kitchen were open to each other, separated by a breakfast bar, and on the other side of that was our massive family room that opened up onto our deck off the back of the house. There was another door to the deck from our dining room as well. We had a three-car garage, four bedrooms upstairs with an attic cupola as a third floor where my kids had a lot of their stuff. At the time, all of our kids were home. Joe was 18, getting ready for college, Jody was 15 and in high school, and my little guy, Will, was 12. I have a successful business as a clinical psychologist that I run from the home. My wife is a realtor who will smack me for referring to our neighborhood as limited. I suppose I should have checked with her before writing this, but she happens to be out of town, so that's my excuse. Yeah, 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 I could call her text, but that doesn't matter. The house was finally built and we moved in mid-August of that year. Perfect timing for our kids to be ready for school and a couple of weeks to get settled in. Everyone was loving the house and the yard and the woods right next door, and my wife decided we should have Thanksgiving celebrated at our place that year. I don't have a very large family, but my wife does, and I love to cook, so of course I said it was a great idea. Her brother and sister came with their families on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. My two nephews and two nieces, both two with each brother and sister-in-law, were obviously with them. All of them were in their teens, and I was surprised that they were actually having a good time. You know how teens can get sullen on family vacations, but my kids got along with them very well, and half the time they were playing video games and just laughing. That night I was up later than everyone getting things ready for the next day so as to not have a mad rush with food on Thanksgiving. Everyone else headed off to bed and I kept up with my prep and a couple of beers. My brother-in-law stayed around too. We were both talking late into the night and ended up falling asleep in my living room. I woke up around 3 in the morning, noticing that it was really cold in the house despite a fire in the fireplace and the heat on. My brother-in-law was in a recliner and sawing wood, so I just got up quietly to see the thermostat. It was working, and that's when I noticed the front door and storm door were wide open. I closed them after looking around outside and went back to the living room to wake my brother-in-law up for bed. In the time that I had walked to the front foyer, the back door to our deck had been slid open and was letting the cold air in as well. I looked at my brother-in-law, but he was out like a light. I figured somehow one of the kids had opened or left the doors open in the front, and the wind had knocked them open completely. I mean, looking back, it was a stupid thought, as there was no way that that could have possibly happened. I still don't have any explanation for the back sliding door, but I made a point to tell everyone to keep the doors shut, as I wasn't heating the outside. <laughs> I was turning into my father. 
I got into bed as did my brother-in-law, and I knew I would have to be up by six to get my smoker ready and another turkey ready for the inside oven. Thankfully, I had done all the prep work the day before. Yay me. When I woke up, my wife was barely stirring, and I mentioned the doors to her. She told me that she had personally locked the front door before going upstairs and couldn't tell me why they were open. I told her I was going to remind everyone to make sure the doors were shut, and she sleepily agreed and went back to sleep, saying she would be up by seven. The house was totally quiet as everyone was sleeping in. Perfect, I thought. I could have my first cup of coffee and get things rolling. I love my family, but moments like that are awesome to me. Knowing that they're all there and safe, having a chance to clear my head and be thankful for everything we had, and then be able to share my love with them and my food later on. Sounds cheesy, but hey, that's me. It's the truth. It was about 6.30 after I had gotten the smoker going out on the deck and came back into the kitchen. I was sipping my coffee and I heard a thumping down in the basement. The door to the basement was in the kitchen, so I wandered over, opened the door and flicked on the lights and walked downstairs. The thumping was getting louder as I walked down the stairs and I couldn't think of what was making that noise. Then I thought maybe my wife had woken up and thrown some laundry in the washing machine and it had gotten off kilter. That was my explanation. As soon as I got to my basement, I looked around and turned on the other recessed lighting, and the thumping stopped. We have a finished basement with another living area down there, a pool table and a bar for entertaining. For one second, I thought maybe some of the kids had come down here to this gaming system and maybe fallen asleep on one of the couches. But upon inspection, the basement was empty. I stood there just trying to figure out what that thumping noise was. And that's when both the dryer and washer doors opened and slammed shut on their own. I had my back to the laundry area when this happened, so I didn't actually see it, but I sure as hell heard it. I jumped as I turned around and then walked over to the machines. I stared at them for a minute and then shrugged my shoulders. Was I just hearing all this in my head? As a clinical psychologist, I know that this is totally possible. But I was trying to add everything up. The strange open doors, the weird sound down here, and I was sure I heard the dryer and washing machine doors open and shut. I wasn't jumping to any conclusions. I was trying to think of rational explanations for everything. But I also knew that everyone was going to be waking up soon, and I needed to get my breakfast pizza and casserole in the ovens to warm up. I walked back upstairs and turned the lights off, and as soon as I got to closing the door, I heard the dryer and washing machine doors open and slam shut again. I couldn't figure it out. I figured I would talk to my wife about it when I got a chance, but I didn't want to tell the entire family strange things were going on and run the risk of ruining Thanksgiving. I was a staunch disbeliever in the paranormal and am still skeptical today, even after telling the rest of my story. I could hear people starting to get up and move around upstairs, so I got breakfast things going, got the big dining room table set for everyone, and waited for them to come down. My wife came down, as did everyone else, in their pajamas, wishing everyone a happy Thanksgiving. My brother-in-law asked me about the smoker and offered his help, which I gladly accepted. Everyone was enjoying their coffee and juice and breakfast when I pulled my wife aside and told her about what I had heard in the basement. She had a strange look come over her face and said, Well, I wanted to tell you something, too. I asked her what was up, and she said while she was washing her face in our master bath, the tub faucet came on and the jets on our whirlpool tub started up. She was worried that maybe there was an electrical problem with the tub, but that didn't explain why the water turned on. I shook my head and said, Something very strange is going on here. We both agreed to keep things to ourselves, but she is an avid nut about the paranormal, and giggling told me she was wondering what else the day would bring. I told her that wasn't funny, gave her a quick swat on her ass, and kissed her and said happy Thanksgiving. The rest of the morning was most of everyone just kind of wandering around as we were going to eat at three. Kids were playing their video games and some were watching the Macy's Day Parade, and everyone was talking amongst themselves about girls and boys and all that kind of thing, except for my 12-year-old and my 11-year-old nephew. I know this for a fact as my nephew wandered into the kitchen and out of nowhere said, Girls are gross. I asked him why he thought that, and he said they get their hair everywhere. And I laughed and went back to the deck to check on the smoker. 
When I went back in for another cup of coffee, my brother-in-law was standing in the kitchen. He also had a weird look on his face and said, Hey, man, can I ask you a question? And I said, Yeah, sure, what's up? He leaned in and said in a low voice, Have you noticed anything strange ever happening in your house? I mean, the place is awesome. I know it's brand new. I'd like to think it's just settling. But I was just upstairs getting my clothes ready and about to jump in the shower when the closet door in our room opened and shut a few times. I mean, I actually saw it happen on the last time. I didn't know whether to tell him about anything else I had noticed going on, but said, man, that's really odd. The house is solid. I mean, I watched the thing being built. He just shook his head and said, well, maybe I had one too many beers last night. But in my mind, I thought, he only had two, and my brother-in-law can tie one on. I didn't say anything else, and he said he was going to get ready and tell the troops that they needed to get dressed as well. Not for the rest of the day, but he was organizing a touch football game in the yard with the kids. That's an old tradition in their family I had forgotten about, and I said I was going to be there too. No way I was missing out on some early football. After making sure the turkey was doing its thing in our oven and the other turkey was smoking away, I went into our side yard where everyone was throwing the ball around and trying to divide up into teams. We started playing after a few minutes and there were tons of laughs and my neighbors came over with their kids to join in. After a while, we took a break to grab some water and my neighbor's son, who was a brilliant kid, asked me who the girl was in the window and why she wasn't playing football with us. I said, what? And he pointed up to one of our bedroom windows and said, that girl with the long black hair, how come she's not playing? My niece on my sister-in-law's side has long black hair, but she was playing with us, as was my niece on my brother-in-law's side, but she's blonde. When I looked up at the window, there was no one there, and I said, who are you talking about? And he said, I just saw a young girl with long black hair looking out at us. Normally, I would have said that he saw a shadow or something, or maybe the glare of the really weak sun and our cloudy weather, but of course, I thought of the other things going on. I just told him he was mistaken, everyone was out here having fun, and we should get back to the game. After another half hour or so, we broke up the game and all went inside laughing, and my sisters-in-law and wife yelling at everyone to go directly to the basement and get our muddy clothes off. The three women had arranged other clothes for them to tramp through the house before getting showered up in the start of our meal. We all got cleaned up, and my wife came into the bathroom as I was shaving. She shut the door, and she had that same strange look on her face. I knew something was going on, and she said, Something is happening in this house, and I don't know what it is. She told me that after she had thrown some laundry in the washing machine from the clothes that we had been wearing outside, she'd gone upstairs into the kitchen, but then heard a thumping in the basement. When she went down there, the entire load that had been put into the washing machine was spread out all over the floor. The other clothes were still piled on top of the machine, and the door was wide open. It had never even started. I immediately asked my wife if she was mistaken about putting laundry in, and she said she was not. My wife may be into the paranormal, but she's a straight shooter and would not have made anything like that up. I then told her about the neighborhood kids seeing someone standing in the window of our front bedroom. We were both getting concerned about what was happening. Something certainly strange was going on. We all got downstairs and people were jumping into the charcuterie board and relish tray, gearing up for the main meal. All of the adults were enjoying a glass of wine or a beer, and my wife poured herself a large glass, and I knew she did so because of everything that had been happening and everything that was bouncing around in her head. I checked on the turkeys and they were almost ready, and then I went upstairs to grab something, and my niece, the young lady with the long black hair, was coming down the stairs. I said, hey kiddo, what's up? As I was walking into the foyer and she was about to pass me. I noticed that our glass chandelier we had hanging from the second floor ceiling started to swing back and forth as she went under it. I'm telling you, it was right out of that movie Amityville Horror. Thankfully, she didn't see it, but I did, and the chandelier was still swaying back and forth as I went upstairs. I stood at the top of the stairs watching it as it slowed down, and my mind began to race. I remembered something from my college studies and post-grad work on my way to my doctorate about parapsychology, but never really gave it a thought. 
Now I was trying to think back about its connection with teenagers and poltergeist phenomenon. I was well aware of all the bullshit nonsense that goes with the paranormal, but something strange was happening, and the fact that two of the odd things happened to involve my niece had my mind running. We enjoyed Thanksgiving dinner and dessert, and everyone was going to just chill out for the rest of the afternoon watching football or playing video games or just catching up and talking like families do. My wife had solved her problem with the wash and had successfully gotten a bunch of clothes clean, and I was on my third beer, just enjoying myself, despite all the strange things that had been happening. My brothers-in-law were taking cat naps, and I could hear the kids upstairs laughing and doing regular teenage stuff. Just sitting in my chair watching the game, I heard a loud crash come from the kitchen. The ladies were up in the formal living room up front, and I could hear them chattering away until the loud crash. I jumped up and ran into the kitchen before anyone else and saw that a large stack of plates waiting to go in the dishwasher that had been sitting on the counter were now smashed all over the floor. No one was in the kitchen. There's no way anyone could have been in there, as I would have seen them walk through our family room, or at least walking out of the kitchen into the dining room, or back into the living room. My wife came in and bumped into me, and I just looked at her wide-eyed. I was trying to piece all of this together. What the hell was going on here? I made some lame excuse to everyone that the dishes must have been on the edge of the counter and fallen off by accident. I blamed myself for being careless, and my sister-in-law and wife helped me clean up the mess. The kids upstairs never heard anything, and none of them came down. The rest of the day was quiet, and around seven in the evening or so, my brothers-in-law whipped up some turkey sandwiches and busted out the relish tray and other things that had not been eaten during our dinner. I love that part of Thanksgiving. The second Thanksgiving. Everyone was now hanging out in the family room and debating what movie we were going to watch that night. My niece, the blonde one, left the room and went upstairs. And when she came back, she had a strange look on her face. And she actually looked like she was upset, and her mother asked her what was wrong. She said she didn't want to talk about it and motioned for her mom to join her in the kitchen. They both left, and we decided on a movie, and everyone got settled in to enjoy it. My sister-in-law came back in the room with my niece and then asked my other sister-in-law if she could speak with her. They both went into the kitchen, and I went in behind them on the auspices of getting beers for my brothers-in-law, but I also wanted to hear what they were going to say. I didn't eavesdrop. I made it clearly known that I was there, and they didn't care. My sister-in-law told my other sister-in-law that her daughter had bumped into her daughter on her way to the bathroom. She said that my black-haired niece was standing in her way on the landing upstairs and started to say some very awful things to my blonde-haired niece. She was calling her a bitch and saying that she was a worthless human being and some other things I don't want to repeat here. My sister-in-law went out to talk to her daughter about this, who of course denied being upstairs. Everyone else quickly heard what was going on. I mean, word travels fast in two rooms. And we all said that was impossible, because my black-haired niece had been in the living room with us. My niece who went upstairs was the only one who left the room. Without going into a panic, I said everyone was probably just tired from the day and we should all just watch the movie and relax. Of course, I got looks from my wife and my brother-in-law who had experienced the weird things earlier that day. But we all enjoyed the movie, and as the night wore on, everyone started to drift off or went upstairs to bed. What happened that night was very odd. When everyone was in bed and asleep, anyone who had a cell phone received a call at the same time. It was from an unknown number, and it came at 2.47 a.m. Everyone's phone either vibrated or rang. Of course, it woke a lot of us up. Those who answered didn't hear anything except a static noise, me included. I didn't know about everyone getting the phone call until the next morning, but the front door and storm door once again were wide open when I wandered downstairs before everyone else. I wondered if there was a connection about those two and the time that they happened. I didn't say anything and just shut the door. We had plans to go to Niagara Falls that day and then hit up an outlet mall in the area so we would all be out of the house, and I thought that was a good idea. Stop thinking about this weird shit until everyone went home, and then try to take a look at it objectively. My wife agreed. We had a blast at the attractions, even though everyone had been to Niagara Falls before. Then we went shopping and then got some dinner out. 
We got back to the house at around 9.30 that night, and all of the lights in the house were on. I never leave the lights in my house on, save for the front foyer and the outside lights, and I control those with my phone. As we were pulling up my driveway, the front bedroom where my nieces were staying was flicking on and off. I looked at my phone and the programming that I had set up, but it showed that all the lights were off except for the foyer and the outside lights. Everyone got out of the vehicles and was going inside, and the minute the garage door to the house opened, the light upstairs stopped flickering, and all of the lights in the house went out. I had no idea what to do. Everyone saw that. I said to my brother-in-law, there must be something in the electric, and I'd have to get my electrician out to take a look at it. But my brother-in-law, who had experienced the closet door, just looked at me skeptically. Thankfully, nothing else happened that night, and everyone was heading home the next day. We saw everyone off and just had that day to crash as our family. Now here's the stranger thing. Nothing happened. I mean, nothing happened for months. Nothing happened for almost the next year. No funny noises, no lights, no sounds, no doors opening. Nothing. My wife and I discussed it over and over and could not figure out what was going on but we both deduced that it had something to do with my niece. Nothing had happened before she got there. Nothing happened after she left. I mean, we weren't looking to blame her for anything, but the coincidence was there. However, things did come back when my niece and sister-in-law visited that summer. A lot of the strange things started happening again. Doors were opening and closing so much and so loud that everyone noticed what was going on. One evening when my niece was lying in bed trying to fall asleep, the entire bed she was on slid all the way across the room and bumped into the wall on the other side of the room. My daughter was in the room to see that happen. Of course, everyone was freaking out, and I was trying to calm everyone down, but my sister-in-law decided that they were going to cut their trip short a day, and my daughter was going to go and stay with them at their house for a week. Again, once my niece left, nothing happened in the house. When I called my daughter during the week just to say hi and check in on her, I asked if anything weird was happening at their house, and she said no. Everything had been awesome. They'd been swimming in their pool, and they went to movies, and were just having a good time. Then came Thanksgiving this past year. Again, we were having everyone over, and I knew everyone was thinking about what had happened the year before. But nothing happened. Everything was normal and fine. I have zero explanation for what happened, but after talking to colleagues and dipping into what are often referred to as the pseudosciences, I wonder if there is some shred of credibility to the theories that poltergeist activities surround teenage girls and that time of the life they are growing up in. I don't know, and I can't say. All I can say is nothing like that has ever happened again since this past summer. My wife, of course, read a bunch of stuff on the internet that was a little too far out there for me, but she is convinced that my niece somehow was affecting our house with her abilities that she wasn't even aware of. As my background is what it is, I've never called any of these so-called paranormal investigators to come in and help with anything. But I did talk to some friends who knew some people in a skeptical society who, without seeing anything or experiencing anything, advised there was likely some logical explanation and we were just not coming up with it. At this point, I don't care. I would rather have my dream house to be exactly what it is. A dream house. I don't care to have any of that crap ever happen again. And here's to 2023 being paranormal free for my family. We Summon Something by Lost Voyage This happened when I was a teen many years back in upstate New York where I grew up. I had a rather bizarre friend at the time who, despite his own encounters with the supernatural, most of which were unpleasant, insisted on trying to explain away everything with logic and rationale. It used to really irritate me to no end, because he would do this with even cartoons and shows we watched. It kind of spoiled the wonder and imagination for sure. I was and am still fascinated with ghost stories and the supernatural. Pretty open-minded, but I do have a healthy dose of skepticism. One day we were in my room having a discussion about the paranormal. I was tired of him finding loopholes and stories, and of course being a teen, I wanted to be right, 
So I had found a story I didn't think he could argue his logic into. Because of what happened, I, to this day, won't relay the exact story I told him. A story I had come across in a book on ghost stories. In fact, I haven't really told many people about it at all. Suffice it to say, the story basically involved a man's ghost being seen by several people many miles away from where he, at that very moment in time, had been killed. A lot of evidence was presented in the story, and so I figured it was fodder for a discussion about ghosts that I would surely win. We talked about it at some length. It was a bright, sunny, and warm day while this was going on, and my parents were downstairs. Though I had some odd experiences in childhood, my home was never considered haunted, at least in the traditional sense. As we talked, something in the atmosphere of my room began to shift. It was subtle at first, but I was sensitive and did notice it. I was so passionate about the topic, though, I tried to disregard it. It felt as if there was a pressure building. Something definitely felt off. It suddenly felt as if we weren't alone, and I was having difficulty arranging my thoughts and expressing them. My room, which had always been a haven for me, always a safe space, always with good energy, began to become a very unpleasant and unfamiliar place to be. My friend's face suddenly went blank, and he stopped talking. I hadn't said anything to him or indicated how I felt up to that point. But when I started to say something else, he stopped me and said, Wait. At that moment, I blurted out, You feel that too? He merely nodded, and his eyes went wide. We decided at that point that whatever was happening was too uncomfortable, and we needed to vacate my room. It didn't feel threatening or dark or evil, but it was as if we had become enveloped in some sort of cloud that had a pressure to it, and it didn't feel right or normal. I remember we moved quickly down the hall and went downstairs, but whatever it was was still with us. I can see it all clearly in my mind even now. My mom was sitting on the couch and slightly distracted, but I told her we were going outside and she nodded and told us it was okay. Looking back, it was so bizarre, I could see my mom, but it was as if she was separated from us by some sort of field, like we were in some kind of fog. The afternoon sun was still streaming in the window behind my mom, and I could interact with her, but I felt cut off. Reality definitely wasn't running right. We went outside to the garage, but it was still with us. I couldn't feel the sunshine, the warmth, and the normal outdoor sounds of a village street had all but ceased. I began to panic, not because of the entity, at this point I wasn't truly aware it was a presence, but because it felt as if I was cut off from the real world, so to speak, as was my friend. Looking back, I have trouble really relaying what I felt and saw. It was unlike anything I had ever encountered, until I recently heard a story that brought it all back. At that point, we tried to flee, to outrun it, and we started down the tree-lined street I lived on, moving towards the downtown area. Then it happened. We got down to the first intersection of a side street, and suddenly it was as if we stepped through a curtain, as if the field had shattered and we were suddenly thrust back into the real world. It was gone. I felt the sun, and it was warm. The street sounds had returned. I could hear children playing, birds chirping, someone mowing a lawn. I mean, the fog had lifted. It's as if we had stepped out of a vacuum of some sort. We both talked about it, but couldn't arrive at anything rational. It shook me up for sure, and later when I returned to my room, the old familiar warm and safe feeling of my room had returned. That alien presence had gone. I asked my mom later if she had noticed anything unusual when I had talked with her during the episode, and she only stated I had appeared subdued at that time. To this day, it's not something I can explain. The feeling of unreality, the closest I can come, is like when a person's sick. Everything feels off. Reality isn't our day-to-day -day experience when we're sick, perhaps because of our physical senses being overwhelmed. I know because many people who have been sick with colds or the flu describe a similar feeling, and I've had it too, it's why I hate being sick. Did my feelings of fear play into it? I'm certain it amplified the experience for sure, but it did not cause it. 
The fact that my friend and I noticed the change in atmosphere at the same time without saying a word about it to each other, and the fact that it left us as suddenly as it had come on, makes no sense. Fear usually takes some time to come down from. It's not something that occurs at the snap of someone's fingers, unless it's not your fear you're feeling. I'm somewhat empathic, so I'm no stranger to someone else's emotions coming and going into my space. Although fear can inspire a feeling of unreality as well, I've experienced extreme anxiety and panic and know the difference between that sense of unreality and what I went through that day. It was totally different. I've gone over this from several different angles, and it took some time to realize that there was some sort of spiritual presence there that day. Most of whatever fear and panic I had were directly related to the fact that I felt as if my sense and connection to reality had been turned upside down, not from a potential ghost. I had felt no evil or malicious or negative feelings in whatever was there. The story I related to my friend wasn't even scary, just a bit creepy. The kind of goosebumps you can get from hearing something bizarre and unexplainable. However, because of what happened that day, I refused to speak the story aloud again. My conclusion is somehow in discussing the supernatural the way we had that day drew something to us. Either a drifting spirit or the object of the story itself. Perhaps it was just curious or wanted attention. Maybe it realized it was freaking us out and that's why it left so suddenly. Since that day, I make sure I'm protected whenever I so much as read a ghost story, either on internet forums or in books, much less speak it aloud to anyone. I firmly believe that you don't need a Ouija board or a fancy seance to summon a ghost. Merely being curious and having an open mind can provide a portal for these experiences. I've had it happen enough that it has been entrenched in me. This experience was a key in forming my beliefs in the supernatural and continuing to fuel an endless fascination in these types of encounters, as well as anything in the spiritual realm. However, it doesn't mean I wish to encounter ghosts myself. It happens, of course, but for me, it's enough to read and study the experiences. I don't go looking for them myself. That, I know, leads to trouble. Take that as advice, if you will. I will mention in closing that my friend later on sort of went into some darker spiritual matters, as he had some personal issues. So he may very well have been key in summoning this spirit, ghost, entity, presence, whatever. He, as I mentioned earlier, had some rather unpleasant supernatural encounters prior to this experience. And of course, we were both teens, which has endlessly been speculated about in poltergeist happenings, though this experience doesn't fit that category. So again, maybe it was just something that could have contributed. I know it wasn't my imagination, yet I can't find too many rational justifications for what occurred. But I concede that I could always have overlooked something. Yet another bizarre, fascinating story from my past. She Was Magic, submitted by Cherry O. I lost my grandmother when I was 32 years old. I was very close with her as I was the only granddaughter she had out of seven grandchildren. Sure, she loved my brothers and cousins, but there was a bond between us that went very deep. I was into just about everything she shared with me. Her love of baking and knitting, bingo and game shows on TV. I still do all those things, and I am a certified game show nut. I was even on The Price is Right once, but never got out of contestants row. But my grandmother was so proud of me, even though I didn't do much to get on other than the standard stuff they ask you to do to be chosen as a contestant. It was a sketchy time in my mid-twenties after that a time where I made a lot of bad decisions in relationships and personal habits. I fell in love with a man who would go on to marry me at 25, beat the shit out of me for the first time at age 26, and introduced me to speed on top of my already hefty drinking problem. I always kept my job, always went to church, but sometimes wearing a little more makeup to hide the beatings, and usually drunk to numb the pain. But my one constant was my grandma. She was always there. At first my family was too, including my brothers, but after my mom died, telling me I was breaking her heart by staying with my man although she was really dying of cancer, I should also mention my dad died when I was 12 in a car accident, my brothers blamed me for worrying my mother and pushing her into a too young and untimely death. 
They said me hanging out with the wrong crowd and marrying my husband put too much worry into her. Maybe they're right, I don't know. After my mom died, my grandma was all I had, and she was much more patient with me than my mom or my brothers. There were plenty of nights that I stayed with her, afraid to go home to my husband when he was on a run, and one time he did come looking for me there, but just one time. While I was hiding there, he showed up hammered and banging at the back door, yelling for me. We were watching TV when it happened, and I just cringed. Grandma patted me on the knee and said, Stay right here. I'll be right back. I did as I was told, and I don't know what she said to him, but things got very quiet, and she came back in the room smiling. He left and never once came back to my grandma's house for as long as he lived. When I asked her what she said to him, she only replied, Magic, honey. She smiled. Magic that will one day take care of him and take care of you, but not in the same way. That night she talked to me straight and told me I needed to get out from under him, that I was welcome to stay with her as long as I wanted to stay, and it would be another year before I left my husband and took her up on that offer. When I did, my grandmother got me into a rehab and supported me getting clean of drugs and booze, and then I went to live with her. My husband and I were separated but not divorced. He never came by, but he would send letters and emails saying the foulest things to me. He tried to paint me poorly on Facebook with old friends and even tried to get me fired from my job when I went back to it. Thankfully, my boss is great and supported me through everything. He still does. But then my husband made a mistake. He sent a threat to my grandma, and she did not take it in stride like I took my lumps and threats. I'd seen her angry before, but this was a different look. I'd never seen it. Her blue eyes seemed to flash like ice under the moon. And when I asked her if she was okay, she just nodded and said, Oh yes, I'm fine, honey. Another year went by and I was finalizing my divorce when a second threat was made to my grandma. This time her eyes seemed to go black. That was also the night she told me that she had been sick for a while and had hidden it from me. Cancer, just like my mom. Her prognosis was not good, and she decided she didn't want any treatment, didn't want to fight, and by the time I found out, it was too late to do anything. I cried and cried when she told me, and I even got angry and shouted at her. She just hugged me and told me it was going to be all right. That's when I saw the letter my husband had sent to her. It was a threat that he was going to kill us both. <laughs> Real genius right there. I was planning on using it as evidence in the divorce and for a stronger restraining order. But I wouldn't have to. Two nights after all that happened, there was a bad thunderstorm. I woke up with the lightning flashing and my grandmother sitting in a rocking chair in my room. She was smiling at me and said my troubles were over with my husband. And her pain was over too. I asked her what she meant and she just smiled and said, Magic, honey. Magic. I got up to give her a hug, but as I got near her, she held up her hand and said, I love you, honey. Please stay healthy for me. Find a new man, have kids, and eventually a granddaughter of your own. I have to go. I love you so much. Then she faded away. Just like that, faded right out of sight. I stood there for a second before running down the hall to her bedroom to find her lying in bed with a smile on her face. I touched her cold hand and knew that she was gone. I cried for the longest time before calling my oldest brother to let him know that she had gone, and he said he was on his way over and would call the police. It wasn't for another two days that I had found out that my now ex-husband had died the same night. He was having a bunch of his asshole drinking buddies over for a party to celebrate his soon divorce. I guess they were all on our old back porch, and he kept telling the dipshits that he saw a flashing light in the rain at the edge of the yard. Beer in hand, he went to investigate, and all they heard him yell in the darkness was, You! What are you doing here, you crazy bitch? Then he yelled out my grandmother's name, Lana, followed by a, No! No! Two of the guys made official statements to that. The time of death was just before my last conversation with my grandma, or what I believe was her spirit. I'm 43 years old now. 
I have a great husband and three kids. I have a special room where I do all my knitting with a TV that I only watch game shows on. I have pictures of my grandma all over the room. Pictures of her alone, pictures with my family, and pictures of both of us throughout our lives. When any of my kids look at them and ask, what was great grandma like? I say, she was magic. This is a true story, whether you believe it or not. My grandma was magic until the very end. <laughs>